now I'll tell you why you can't speak English fluently, accurately and confidently sometimes even after doing a complete program in an English language institute. I'm going to tell you how you can avoid the mistakes committed by the English language learners, most of them at least. And I'm going to tell you how to put in the efforts and time on YouTube wisely. Watch every second of this video and if you do, you'll learn how to start on the successful path towards effective spoken English. How to make sure you learn the right things you will actually need to speak English fluently and not burden yourself with unnecessary theories and rules and tons of dry vocabulary and so on. Hello everyone, what's going on? This is Manu from TELW, the English Workshop. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. It's great to be with you all today. We talk about how to improve your English communication skills, how to become fluent, accurate, assertive and confident in English. We also take care of specific and focused skills like presentation, negotiation, email writing and so on and general personality development skills as well. Today, I'm going to give you some really cool stuff that will show you why you can't speak English fluently and what you should do to set it right. What you really need to focus on while learning English. If you want these videos on a regular basis, subscribe to my channel right now and I promise I'll keep you guys posted every time I get a video up. I also love reading your comments. Alright, so why you can't speak English fluently? Yeah, why can't you speak English fluently? Let's look at a common scenario, okay? Um, okay, uh, you go to uh, this cool, groovy English language institute with a nice five-star look and feel. You pay heavy fees and your teacher has also very impressive, great accent, years of teaching experience, certified to teach English. They teach you great things like those grammar rules and exceptions and irregular verbs and subjunctives and nominatives and modifiers and progressives, 14 different ways of using will. They got those cute little phonetic charts hanging on the walls and you memorize 20 words a day with the meanings and you know them all. You do role plays, do quizzes, you memorize dialogues, you know what to say when you enter the barber shop. But you still can't speak English fluently. Forget about confidently. Bye. By the way, like this video and subscribe to my channel. You're wasting your time on YouTube if you don't subscribe to my channel. Why you can't speak English confidently and that's because you know the theory but you don't practice. It's like, you know, reading tons of books on swimming but not actually entering the water. How will you learn swimming? And because of that, you fall back on your mother tongue when you want to communicate. When you want to speak, for instance, and you end up translating. That's easy, isn't it? But that kills your English. So there is one extremely neglected fact about learning English and therefore of teaching English as well. When you learn a language for communication, you need to learn three things. The body language, the voice quality and grammar. Now there's this chap called Albert Morabian, great intelligent chap. He discovered well, that an overwhelming 55% of our communication is body language. 55%, yeah, and 38% is voice quality, that would be pronunciation and all that. And just 7% is grammar that they teach you in school, the verbal bit. Now, don't go by Meribin's statistics. What he simply said, and this is more important, the real meaning of what he said, very deep. Body language is way more important than grammar. That is eight times as important as grammar. And the voice quality is over five and a half times as important. So if grammar is one, voice quality is five, and body language is eight, so you learn one, and you don't bother about the rest 
And you think that you should know English perfectly well? Well, yeah. So let's look at all of them briefly. You know, these three things. Body language, voice quality, and grammar. So we're going to see what we need to focus on to learn how to speak English fluently and why we need to focus on them. Let's start with the body language. This actually helps your listener understand you easily and clearly. In other words, it facilitates understanding. So, uh, let's say uh, you smile and it normally means you're friendly. If you stand with your hands across your chest, it means you're challenging, like that underground dawn. Let's say uh, somebody asks you, okay, where is the Taj Mahal? And you point your hand and say, it's there. Now, that guy said, okay, great, thanks. And instead of that, if you stuff your hand in your pocket and say, is there... What do you think that questioner is going to feel? Now, these are some of the basics of body language. There are other deeper levels that you need to be trained in in order to be comfortable with the language. Now, I want you to note that the principles of body language are not restricted to English. You can apply them to any language. It's actually a tool of communication. That's all. Now, see, essentially, um, the proper body language can power up your thinking and you start speaking in tighter sentences. You make more declarative statements. You become more assertive. But, and this is a big but, you've got to beware of a couple of things in body language. For instance, you might say something and your body language might say something else. You know, uh, for instance, uh, you may feel very confident but if you wring your hands, you know, hold it like this, for instance, that could be seen as a sign of nervousness or hesitation. Try steepling instead. Or better still, hold something, maybe a pen in your hand while you stand there presenting. And another one could be, you know, excessive wild movements, you know. Um, let's look at the gestures once again. If they go beyond your body outline, for instance, you may be seen as chaotic or out of control. <laughs> you got to be a bit careful there. The second thing would be voice quality. Now, um, I'll be very brief here. You need to know different aspects of voice quality to make your spoken word clear, powerful and effective. You know, um, <laughs> proper pronunciation means, you know, learning the sounds and stresses and intonation and so on. For instance, uh, let's look at thanks. Okay, uh, intonation on this one. I can say, thank you, or thank you, or thank you. See, different intonations, vastly different meanings. Do you know what each of them means? Tell me in the comments below. And if you use a, bo a wrong body language on this one, that complicates matters further. So in English, there are about 44 sounds. You should know how to enunciate those sounds properly. And for that, you should know which parts of your mouth you have to use to, uh, uh, to, to enunciate which sound, etc. Then there's another thing called stress. Um, a very classic example is you know, uh, the change in stress from photograph, photography, photographic look at this academy academic look at the change in stress with this change in uh, the word form um, then uh, let's look at these two sentences over here one is smaller than the other but the time taken by both will be the same so I'll say he'll buy the bag that's the first one the second one is going to be He's going to have bought the bag. See, different sentence lengths, but the same duration. Intonation, like I just said, it, uh, is used to show your emotions. Anger, surprise, hesitation, etc. Uh, it makes your spoken word actually very dynamic, you know, very interesting, actually. You know, uh, so you can be, for instance, curious, surprised, disappointed, angry. In agreement, uh, it reflects your mood correctly. You know, that's the rise and fall in pitch, the music of the language, you know, the cadence as well. So um, let's look at this word really. Okay, 
Now I can say really in different ways now. So I can say, really? 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 Can you say which really matches with which emotion on the right hand side? Give it to me in the comments below there. So you need to know where to raise the pitch, where to drop it, etc. And what that means and all that. And a last thing I'd like to touch upon on this uh, voice quality business is linking. So you have CC, CV and VV links. Uh, for instance, look at this sentence. If I say hired a builder, that sounds sick. But if I say hired a builder, that is natural and fluent. So links help you improve your fluency. The third bit I said was grammar. In this, um, all right, now you got those things like, you know, those huge words I used earlier, subjunctives and modifiers and progressive and all that. That is the grammar which you don't really need to learn unless you're going to teach. If you just want to use English to speak, to communicate, there are certain aspects of grammar that you need to learn, not the whole lot. So the Renan Martin is a useless piece of book for you there. Um, the first thing that I would want you to focus on is the word order. In English, we have uh, what's called the SVO grammar. There's a particular order of the words when you speak. For instance, uh, you'd say, I eat apples. But if you translate from, let's say, Hindi, the word order would be, I apples eat. So um, that's the difference in word order and it could lead to a lot of confusion. Uh, this is actually a huge subject and um, difficult to be covered in, in one single dedicated video. But if you are interested, do let me know and I'll make a video on this also. Uh, the second thing that I want you to learn is the articles a and and the we got a video on this one watch that three videos actually um this is a major problem amongst the so-called non-native speakers of english so for instance you might hear somebody saying i went to one market actually what that person wanted to say was i went to the market now the idea is very clear the number is one but the speaker doesn't know if it is the or a uh or one. You will hear people saying, I went to Ann Market. Rare, but yes, not unusual. So in the school, they'll definitely teach you these things, but not the practical aspect. You learn that these articles exist, but you won't know just how to use them. One more thing I, wanted, uh, I want you to... Uh, no, is the, uh, the, the the phrasal verbs, you know, like get on, get off, etc. So uh, they are very common in English, especially in the spoken English. And that's becoming uh, common in the written word as well these days, especially if it's not the academic or extra formal word. For instance, uh, you say, turn on the TV. But I've heard people say, on the TV. Or open the TV. These are the translations, also manufactured forms. Now, with these phrasal verbs, um, you actually sound very natural, very comfortable with the language. But what we need to know is nobody can teach us all these phrasal verbs. Not in the best school can do that. Naturally, too, uh, you know. Um, but you need to know that they exist. You need to know how to identify them, how to understand that they are phrasal verbs and see how they are used in the written word or the spoken word. Uh, you need to know what they look like, how to use them, uh, how they sound, what's a picture that they draw, etc. Phrasal verbs, very important. Now, a very common demand by a lot of students is idioms. They want to learn idioms. They feel they sound rather cool with idiomatic expressions. You know, they feel like they belong. Uh, see, uh, you can be very focused and to the point when you use idioms, undoubtedly. So you follow the principle of communication, talk less, say more. 
and you also sound less boring actually you sound more witty very interesting and very confident and and natural and in command of what you're saying idioms yes but there's a very big problem you can't simply open a book of idioms and learn the first hundred of them and start using them the next day because most of these idioms um, a large number of idioms are actually regional for instance if i say fair words butter no parsnips and if the listener is an american he's gonna scratch his head he doesn't understand this what the hell are you talking about so we got to be careful while using these idioms and another thing that we got to be careful about is translating idioms from our mother tongue for instance in hindi there is uh, an idiom which when translated into english uh, is uh, you know uh, goes something like the five fingers are not the same if you say the five fingers are not the same your native english speaker or a non indian mostly is going to scratch his head so you got to go up to their level and we use an english um equivalent of that and say it takes all kinds to make the world shorten to it takes all kinds so idioms yeah but don't ignore idioms if your english is good enough let's say uh if you are if you are a very good intermediate level student and you want to go to the advanced level idioms are your thing um one last thing i want to talk to you about is uh reading this is one of the steps to improve your english see there are a few points to remember first is the article of the book or whatever you want to read should be something that you're actually interested in you know the topic should be interesting to you for instance i love computers doesn't mean you love computers as well you can love sports you can love animals wildlife whatever and um, the other thing is when you read that you analyze what's written let's take one passage and you see how it's developed what's the main idea expressed in the passage and how that's fleshed out how it's structured and how it flows etc this is what lends the article the comprehensibility you know why you understood it clearly or why you didn't understand it clearly that means the writing is bad and why it is bad you should be able to analyze this um of course the teacher is going to teach you but yeah this is one major point that you'll have to uh understand the other thing i want you to do is to read loudly whenever you read see this will give your tongue the much needed practice after all learning a language involves a lot of muscle memory muscles of your tongue that is the tongue has got muscles and that's got memory and the language should settle in that memory not in the memory of your brains your brain should be involved in uh developing the content not the language language is secondary it's just a vehicle so that's it in this video hope this helps you out Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. If you want more videos on learning how to communicate in English effectively and powerfully, subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to like this video and leave your comments as well. See you in the next. Until then.